Hello the racing fans, welcome back to episode 5 of the Countdown to Chowning series, brought to you as part of the Ginger Joe Racing Show in association with betting.co.uk. And I'm back again with my wingman, Joe from JM Racing, and we're here actually bringing you four each race selections for you. Some of the bigger priced fancies that we like at the Chowning Festival 2022 this year. And then at the end of the show, we will also be doing a quick review of some of the action that went ahead this weekend, and that will be a uh, regular fixture as part of the show with Joe and I now moving forward. Also, if you'd like to get in touch with Joe and myself a little bit more, we do have a free Discord chat, and I'll pop the link in the description below there if you'd like to come over and join us there. We put up plenty of extra winners, extra information, plenty of stuff to like, and if you want to do that, just come over and I'll pop the link in the description below. But without further ado, Joe and I are going to get straight on with the selections. Joe, do you want to bring us your first one? Yeah, so it's going to come in the Coral Cup, and it's unexpected party at 12 to 1 for a skeleton team that I do think will have a very good festival. They're not really known for big race winners at the festival, but I think they'll have a decent shot festival here. So yeah, I think an expected party in the Coral Cup at 12 to 1 looks a good bet. Now, what you need to win this race is generally a young up and coming horse that's not exposed and looks ahead of the handicap. And this horse definitely fits the bill. He's a seven year old and he's only had the six runs over hurdles and he's shown a lot of progression in all of them starts. And he's going to be going off a mark of around 140 after a very good win at Ascot last time. He won by four and a half lengths that day and was given a very good ride by Harry Skelton. And I think he would have won by a lot further if it wasn't for him fluffing the last hurdle, but he still won by four and a half to then the mud up. £12 for that, which on the face of it does look a lot, but he won with so much in hand that day. And the way he travels, he travelled into that race so strongly. And I think that's definitely something that you'd need for a race like this. You can imagine how he's skilled and just picking them off one by one, coming down the hill and coming into the home straight with a very good chance. And I think even his form before Ascot, he does have form over this course and distance when second to the booming water. Now that form has worked out quite well since the booming water has gone on to one again and he pulled clear of third that day which was also very impressive because some of the horses in behind have run well since. So in general I just think at 12 to 1 I think you'd be hard to find this horse finishing outside of the top few and I think at 12 to 1 is a bet for me. Could be one hell of a party as well for the Scouts if he gets it done, couldn't he? Like you said, Joe, he could have won with any amount in hand that day. I really like that performance as well. Okay, cool. So unexpected party for Joe at 12 to 1 in the Coral Cup, Joe. Um, and my selection yeah. will be Mortal, my first selection running the cross country chase at 16 to 1, trained by Gordon Elliott. This one. Um, and with Mortal, I actually think it's particularly um exquisite that he's gonna be really well suited by the cross country course. So don't get me wrong. I do think Tiger Roll is going to be really hard to beat and what looks likely to be his last run. Hopefully it will be a fairy tale run for him. But there's still definitely a case to be made for my each way selection here, Mortal. He's an ex-Gigginstown recruit himself and actually hit quite a decent level before switching to the cross-country fences. Now, he's only got the one cross-country run to date and that was at Cheltenham at the December meeting. He was a really eye-catching runner back and forth. I've gone back and watched this race more than one on more than one occasion just to make sure I've got all of this right. Um, and just to mention as well, uh, before I go into the form a little bit, horses generally improve a ton for their first starts over the cross-country chase. And Mortal definitely won't need to improve too much to get involved at the festival if he goes there fully fit. Um, now, the race in December was actually won by Diesel Dallier. I was there that day and he picked Potter's Corner by a nose. Uh, both those horses improved greatly for their previous cross-country um, runs. And I think that Diesel Dally had three previous runs, Potter's Corner himself twice, uh, but they improved a lot, a lot that day and really looked like smart horses, to be honest, as well. Also in third that day was Henry de Bromed's plan of attack. He went, actually went off the well-backed favourite at about 9-2, to two, I think it was, coming off. But another, um, he actually finished fourth on his first run before coming up to finish third this time around. So you can sort of see the trend that I'm going with here. Um, back and forth that day was Mortal, my selection at 16 to 1. And he actually started at the back of quite a widespread field. And over the first four or five fences, he actually made quite a few um, mistakes, which wouldn't have actually done him done him any good at all. Wouldn't certainly wouldn't have helped his chances. But he was smart and experienced enough to put himself right. And to be honest, he got better as the race went on. Let's not forget as well that they do jump 32 real obscure obstacles here. It's not like they're just doing flat to flat fences. 
Um, he made hard work of the first five or six, which definitely wouldn't have helped his chances, but he moved up the field quite nicely and made some really nice headway. Even though he started to make some headway, he was then badly hampered at the fifth, which again made him lose his position. He then had to get rousted along. And although he was rousted along, he did have loads of ground to make up, but he responded seriously well and picked up some places and responded like a really good horse. Um, he sat in about fourth or fifth position just before the home turn, and he then had a bit more misfortune, did Mortal. Um, he slipped and lost about six lengths before two out. And even though he then lost more ground, he still managed to ping the last two and he stayed on really well just to finish about eight lengths back behind three horses who, to be honest, had the whole race tactically go their way. I think Mortal maybe lost around 20 lengths due to the mistakes that weren't actually entirely his fault due, uh, throughout that race. And the fact that he managed to get so close regarding all that misfortune on his first time leads me to think that there must be some more significant improvements come, especially after just the one run over the cross-country course. What I do find significant as well is Gav uh, Gordon Elliott actually books extra schooling events at the Charlton Racecourse for his runners. So I'm sure he's going to improve quite a ton for that as well. And I just think 16 to 1 is the wrong post. Don't get me wrong, Tiger Roll is going to be hard to beat, but for the each way places, 16 to 1 for Morton on his second out team, which I think is going to help him a lot, is just way too big. And that one will do for me. Joe, who's your next selection? Yeah, well, my next one's going to come a bit left field, and it's surprise package in the county hurdle at 25 to 1. And I'm hoping he can just be that for Peter, joined by Peter Farhi, who definitely knows how to get the money for this, is a shrewd trainer. And he might not be one of them big Irish names like Willie Mullins or Gordon Elliott, but I think he's a very good trainer in his own right. And I think this horse fits the bill of something that will run well in the county hurdle. As I said, it's trained over in Ireland and they seem to win all these handicaps and have loads chucked in. So I'm hoping this might be the one. And he's running lots of big field races and it's all the right races that would set him up for a race like this, in my opinion. He's got some good big field form as well. He's finished seventh, second and ninth this season out of some very competitive races. And although he hasn't won any, I think that's probably going to favour him as he'll get a nice enough mark for this. And he's been running very consistently in all of them. And I think he's one to still be open to some improvement. He's only six and he hasn't had loads of starts over hurdles, but he jumps well enough as well. And he's just the type that you think will be stolen, stolen away in mid division and I think he'll stay this trip quite easily because he does have some nice form over two and a half miles so it's going to be a strong pace in the county hurdle it always seems to be and he'll definitely be staying on at the end I think he'll have a mark in the mid 30s after the English handicapper has added his tax for the Irish trains but I think even still then he might just be a horse on the up age six and at 25 to one I think there's much worse bets to have in that race. Well, you've got quite a good anti-post book building up now, Joe. So getting a 25 to 1 shot in there, definitely I'm going to be having a go as well. And if you want to have a look at the slip, I will actually back these myself. In the Discord chat, I will actually put up the slip of these four selections so you can come and have a look after. But my fourth selection comes in the Triumph Hurdle at 20 to 1, and it's my salute for the Milton Harris team. And if you've been watching this series so far, you will already know what I think about this juvenile. I'm just echoing what I've said all, se all series, to be honest with you. Um, he comes from the Milton Harris team um, and is now four for four over hurdles. And I just can't believe you can still get 20 to one about this horse. Joe, you know what I think of this horse. I absolutely love him. And I know this is starting to become a real hot contest, but Knight's salute form just keeps getting franked. Everything looks better. He's ticking all the boxes, especially with Porticello winning impressively, obviously, this weekend as well. To me, Knight Salute, the biggest problem with him is actually finding a kink in that armour. I just don't think he does a lot wrong. He's super versatile type. And I've just got a few things to tick off here, which just obviously shows how versatile he is. He won off a slow pace. He won off a fast pace. He's won left-handed. He's won right-handed. He's won on good ground. He's won on soft ground. He's got really good chance of form where he won, a real valuable key piece of form that he's got. He's a dual-graded winner already. He also won the Summit. He easily beat Impulsive one twice, He ha who has also won since in really good fashion. The times of all four of these runs keep getting quicker, and he also beat Porticello with a little bit in hand, who was really impressive this weekend. And Joe, I know you're keen on him as well. Um, I just think he goes here a little bit overlooked at 20 to 1. I know we've got Pied Piper, Vauban, Porticello. They're all single figures and all really good horses. Um, but we're quick enough to shorten horses in the bet and after a win. Um, but we haven't actually seen Knight Salute since the 11th of December. So he is actually coming into this race maybe a little bit unnoticed. 
Um, he goes well fresh, which he showed when he won first time out, and he's coming here under a ride from the Cheltenham master, Paddy Brennan. I just don't see what's not to like about him, Joe. And whilst he's still 20 to 1, I'm going to get him in that lucky 15 for our viewers, and that will make up the four for me. Um, so there are mine and Joe's four selections for the lucky 15. As I said, I will post the slip into our Discord chat as well. But what we're going to do now, and we're going to start adding a regular feature to the show. We're going to do a bit of a weekend review. Joe's going to kick us off by taking a look at some of the performances just gone. Um, Joe, who have we got up first? Yeah, I think it's fitting to start with Porticella, who fits nicely with the old tip for the triumph. And I think he was very impressive at Haydock with Joshua Morlock. He's one that maybe has been a little bit erratic in starts before, but... This start, he settled nicely. He jumped the best I've seen him and he pulled away by 17 lengths to win. So there was nothing not to like about that performance. That ground is very soft at Haydock, as we saw in some of the other races where only three horses finished. But he was still going nicely enough at the line. And I think that should, he'll stay for the triumph. And as you said earlier, his form ties in closely with Knight Salute. But do you think that maybe Porticello since been beaten by Knight Salute has maybe improved past him because he's been impressive at Chepster and the other day at Herdor. Yeah, that's def definitely a possibility. I mean, I can't obviously deny that fact. The reason I put up Knight Salute is purely on a price basis where I think Porticello, what is he now, Joe? 7 8 to 1, isn't he, for the Triumph, I think now? Um, but he, I've got to be honest, he really impressed me this weekend because although I don't not like the horse, I'm in the Knight Salute camp. So I'm just always, whatever he does, I expect Knight Salute to do a little bit better. But that being said, he won really well on like really bottomless heavy ground this weekend. And to be fair, Porticello actually beat quite a good field as well. The most impressive part for me was that at the end when he was at when he had to get niggled along purely out of it being heavy ground, he responded so easily. He did look like a really smart horse. I definitely have him above uh, Phil Dorr, absolutely, because I don't think Phil Dorr shows the turn of foot Porticello does. And to be honest, I think Porticello's probably being overlooked a little bit as well. I know Pied Piper and Vauban were really impressive, but the thing I like about Knight Salute and Porticello as well is we've got a little bit of experience over the Irish as well. They've both had four or five runs now, and I think that's going to bode well for us in sort of a juvenile race. It's going to be a tough, you know, because this is coming on the on the Friday, we're gonna, there's going to have been a lot of racing that week. And I, just, I do, I really think the English do have got chances. I know visually Pied Piper and Vauban are impressive. Has Porticello gone past Knight Salute? I don't know. I'm hoping there's still a bit more from Knight Salute, but I am also in the same camp with Porticello. So I'm not sure. I'm going to sit on the fence with that one for now, Joe. But what I will say is I don't think it's as clear cut as what the betting's, betting's suggesting at the moment. Yeah, and well, moving on to later in the card, we saw Hillcrest too. I know you quite fancy for the Albert Barlow and you must have been pleased with that performance because if you look at it they went off quick enough Hillcrest and Green Buck who folded and was beaten by a hundred lengths and it showed that Hillcrest stays all day is a very nice type and that was probably his most impressive performance and it definitely showed he stays the three miles what was your immediate reaction from that verse. I love him, Joe. I absolutely love Hillcrest. I've got him at some bigger prices. It's one of my better anti-post selections, I will say, because I've had a few that have fizzled out that aren't even going now. But I love Hillcrest. He's absolutely massive. And because he's so big and he just gallops, I just think he's absolutely crying out for this like Albert Bartlett trip. And in a year where we're not totally sure if there's a standout selection, I just think he's gone overlooked. He's trained by Henry Daly. If this one was trained by Mullins, bringing in this for me, to be much, much shorter in the bet. And you can still get about eight to one for Hillcrest. I was really, really impressed, Joe. Just again, echoing what I sort of said all season, really great traveller, good jumper, and he had some good horses in behind him as well. I was quite quite concerned about Green Book, but he put him to bed, no problem. So I really do. I think Hillcrest is a proper horse. And although he's probably more of a stayer for the future, I think this one is going to be bang on for the Albert Bartlett and is still a strong selection for me at this point. Yeah, he definitely seems like the one which, whatever he does this season, will be much better over chasing in the future as well. As we head over to Ascot, where Fakir Dudley won the grade one. Now, I'm in the opinion that he did well to win, but I didn't really learn that much about the horse from it because he didn't beat the most vintage field. And I still don't think he'll be getting close to Alaho, but it was a good enough win at the end of the day. Yeah, I think he's like one of these horses, isn't he? He's frustrating. You know he's got class, but although he's picked up a few grade ones, he almost feels like he's that grade two horse finishing second. I can't see him beating Alaho or anything like that at the festival, don't get me wrong. And I'll hold my hands up as well. And so I actually put Fakir up as my lay of the weekend. I didn't fancy him at all, but I should have foreseen obviously the Irish form coming over to England. I just didn't see it myself, but I don't think he's going to be 
winning a race at the China Festival, a really nice horse of JP, and I haven't got too much to add. But fair play to Connections, they came over and managed to win the chase just to add another grade one to his resume. Good horse, Joe, but just not for me for the festival anyway. Yeah, and finally, Goshen won the Kingwell Hurdle for the second time. Now, he does seem a very chucky horse to train, but the combination of soft ground and going right-handed seems the key to him. Now, I was very impressed with him because Adagio is no mug for sure. He was very good when second off a top weight in the Unibet handicap off 11 stone Bob, I think it was. Now, he is definitely one to keep an eye on for the future, but Goshen is definitely an enigma, but on his day, he's a very good horse. Yeah, he is like, like there's no secret they were ready this weekend. Porticello, Goshen, they had a couple of other nice runners as well, the Moore team as well. And to be honest, again, I got this one wrong. I was just about in the Adagio camp, uh, Adagio camp, who, let's face it, can't jump a hurdle to save his life, but still managed to get fairly near um, Goshen, to be honest. And when they turned for home and they came at the top, I actually thought then that was prime position for Adagio just to pick up the pieces and he came there travelling. But he just doesn't seem to know how to jump Adagio. He's clearly got this big engine. And if he was a better jumper, I do honestly think he would have got the better of Goshen. But look, I take my hats off to the Moore team. You've got to jump. You've got to get away. You've got to, you know, this is a jumping game at the end of the day. You've got to get around. And he was really impressive because he was asked a little question turner for home as well. Um, but yeah, got the job done. I'm just, again, I'm sitting on the fence a bit with Goshen here, Joe. Take my hat off. Good result. But again, where do they go from here? That's the question. It's the same with Fakir for me. He's just just one of those who's sitting on, sitting on the fence, Joe. Good horse, good performance. That'll do. I'm not going to say anything else about it. Yeah, there's not many too many options going right-handed for this horse, but it might be interesting to see him on the flat as well because the Gary Moore team, obviously, do all try and they do very well in both. But that just about wraps up the weekend review. So thanks a lot for watching from both me and Joe. We'll be back in the next few days with another Cheltenham video. So make, make sure you stay tuned for that and we'll see you next time.